Matthew chapter 8. Matthew writes, when he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And right away a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. And he said to him, Am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed. And he said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, go, as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. And Jesus went into Peter's house, and he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. And so he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And then she got up and began to serve him. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, so that, so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. You can be seated. I'd like for us for just a bit to go back in time in your mind. I'd like to take you to a different place in a different time. Not to the scene where we just were. Not to the scene that he recorded. But to about 40 years after that. Probably the early 70s A.D. Paul, the great apostle, he had already been killed. Peter was gone as well. Jerusalem had been destroyed. John was still around, but his brother James, he was one of the first to be killed. And here we find Matthew still working for the Lord, still, still telling about this new kingdom, still preaching. And here in this scene that I want us to see is Matthew gathering his notes Perhaps he pens it himself. Maybe he dictated it to, to uh, a couple of scribes that was common at the time. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Matthew is writing the narrative of the birth and ministry, death and resurrection, ascension of Jesus. He gives us an account. We call it the gospel according to St. Matthew. Now, there's no way he could record everything. John had already written, or John will write about that in a few years later. He'll say, there's so much that he did, all that if we were to write it all down, there wouldn't be books that fill up the whole world. So what was chosen was specific. Matthew, as he writes, he has to be specific about what he wants to tell us. Each, each account here is shared with intent guided by the Holy Spirit, and chosen for a purpose. 
What's he want us to learn about God? What's he want us to learn about ourselves? Oh, what's he want to tell us about the way that we see our lives and life around us? What do we do there? And if we're careful, often we'll learn about all of those in the text. Whatever we do, as we listen here and we dig into this, we're wise to realize that Matthew, an eyewitness, being guided carefully by the Holy Spirit, arranges this with intent, intent of encouraging, challenging, and changing you and I. So here we find, Dan read the beginning of chapter 8, first 17 verses of chapter 8. Jesus has just finished the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew gives three very quick scenes, three quick miracles. Oh, in just a bit, he's going to demonstrate Jesus' authority over nature as he calms the sea, over uh, uh, demons as he casts out demonic. But we're not there yet. There's something of a first priority here. These are the first miracles to be detailed in Matthew's account of the gospel. These are the first ones. Oh, but he made a passing reference earlier, oh, that Jesus healed. But nothing like this. Now he dives in, and he tells us about what's going on. He tells us in specifics, in three very specific things that I think are, are here for a reason. There's something special about these three that he wants us to get. As a matter of fact, in here, he's never even mentioned that a person had faith until this moment. Three quick scenes. Each of these honestly deserve their own sermon, but sometimes, sometimes you can miss the forest or see a tree and miss the forest, so to speak. We're going to look at the forest today. We're going to step back and see what he's doing. And here's a, a, a Bible study tip. Uh, I'd say a pro tip, but I don't know that I'm qualified to say that. So we'll just go with a Bible study tip. The intent of the author is always the goal. What did the person who penned this, guided by the Holy Spirit, what did they intend for us to get? If we start there, that's where we start to make application. If we can figure out why they did what they did, uh, we're on good grounds to understand what the text is about. So three scenes, a man with leprosy, a Roman centurion, and then a woman who's sick. Three scenes, back to back to back. Scene 1. Look at verse 1 again, Matthew 8. When he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And right away, a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing. Be made clean. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. And immediately as Jesus comes down from the mountain. So immediately as Jesus is, is, is done preaching the sermon on the mount, uh, he comes down and immediately at Jesus' word, he's healed. And I, I can say this, as someone who has preached a few sermons, I can promise you Jesus is tired here. He's tired. You know, we, we, we elevate sometimes his deity over his humanity. He's the only one like him. He is fully God and fully man. He's tired here. And he comes down, and right away, he's asked to go into more ministry. And this isn't just someone with a cold. This is leprosy. Oh, today we call it Hansen's disease. Back then, it was fatal. They had a literal six-foot rule. That, that didn't just come out a few years ago. Six-foot rule. You wouldn't come six foot within someone who had leprosy. If you have leprosy, honestly, you can't go home. Well, because you'd get others sick. You can't go home. You, you, you can't go to work. You can't go to worship. You're always on the outside, always distanced you can't go near others. They, they literally viewed folks with leprosy as the walking dead, like zombies. That's how they viewed these folks. I, I remember um, about a, 10 years ago, I, I had a chance to go on a, a missions trip to India, and I was in southern India, and um, we get done preaching, 
folks had come up to have us pray as if our prayers were, I, I, I wanted to say, you realize your faith is so, I look up to your faith, not the other way around. But they'd asked to pray, and we're praying, and there was this one, uh, when I say little gal, she was probably four foot two, maybe weighed 60 pounds. Uh, older, older gal in her probably late 60s. That's not older these days. Uh, but that's, I, I said that and thought, I just stepped in it there. We better correct that. That's, she's young. <laughs> Back to it. But I'm praying. I've got my arm around her, and, and, and I, I'm praying, and there's a translator translating. And it hits me halfway through the prayer. She doesn't have any toes, and she's missing several fingers. She has leprosy. And so as I'm praying, the Old Testament's going through my mind. And what's happening is my mind is suddenly I'm being transported to a leper colony and, you know, my kids are having to visit. How was the game, champ? You know, from a, from a distance, I'll never see my family again. And I'm like, oh, no. You know, your mind does crazy things, right? And I, I, I guarantee I'm not the only one that's let their mind get ahead of them before. Okay. So there happens to be a doctor with us. And I, as soon as we get done, I'm going over to, to speak to this doctor because I need to make sure that I'm not about to die. And I, I'm, I usually think pretty clear under, under you know, heavy, uh, tense circumstances. So by the time I get to her, I'm, it comes out like this. I'm dying of leprosy. Tell my wife I love her. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I just, th this gal here clearly has leprosy. She stopped. She's like, hold on. She had leprosy. She does not now. We have something called antibiotics now. You're fine. Here's the deal. It's scary, isn't it? Who's, who's had a, you know, don't raise your hand, but if you've had that diagnosis before, you actually get a chance to talk to the doctor, and you're like, oh, no. Because those words sometimes that attend that, and leprosy is the king of those. It's scary. And here he has the audacity to make his way up to Jesus if you're willing. Now, you would expect, think about this, Jesus is about to heal someone at his word, right? At his word. A man who's not even there is healed, but here Jesus knows what he needs and he touches him. Can you imagine what that did for his heart? even more than the disease, just to feel touch again. Because no one had in a long time. Just the, the beauty of Jesus' words, I am willing. The response of an all-powerful and gentle king. I am willing. And he reached out his hand and he touched the man. And he was whole again. That's just the first scene. So, quick scene there. Now, there's so much more to, to say on that, but we need to move on because scene number two is here. Remember, we're in Galilee. We're near the Sea of Galilee. Or, of course, if we're in Galilee, we've got to be near the Sea of Galilee. Jesus' home base is Capernaum. There, a Roman centurion comes up to him. If, if you've been watching that show, The Chosen, right? So if you haven't, you should. It's good. It'll help you to see it. But if you've watched that, Gaius is a centurion. That's, that's his role. Uh, uh, Roman army. So they had a legion of uh, several legions, but each legion had 6,000 soldiers. And then in there, you'd have cohorts that went down to 1,000, and it broke down to where there was a smaller group of 80 to 100 soldiers, and on top of the, above them was a centurion. He'd have non-commissioned officers under him. So he's a mid-level management guy. That's who he is. He's got about 100 soldiers that work for him. He knows what it is to be an authority. Hey, this is going to happen. Military, if we say this, this is what's expected. I say this. This happens. And here, he finds Jesus. And he brings the plight of his servant to Jesus. My servant is, is paralyzed. 
He, he's, in, he's in agony. You know, you, think, you may not have worked out exactly who Jesus is, but he knows that this man has said that he can heal. And if there's a, a healing to happen, I'll do whatever it takes for someone that I care, right? I'm going to get to them. And he goes to Jesus. Jesus answered, am I supposed to go to healing? Surely this man knows, because he works there, that there is no way that a Jewish man's going into his home. It's just not going to happen. Let alone to really take time, because he's on the other side. He's on the other side. Just picture World War II, a, a Polish person asking a German officer for, or a German officer asking a Polish person, I had that backwards, there for, for help. It, it doesn't make sense. And yet he comes to Jesus. And he says, I, I'm, I'm a man under authority as well. Actually, that's pretty advanced theology for this point in the story. Two, two important things to notice here real quick. Two very important things. Look at verse 10. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said uh, to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. Um, if you're one that likes to write in your Bible, underline faith here. If you don't, just underline it in someone else's Bible. This is the first time in Matthew's account of the gospel where it says that a person has faith. This is the very first time it says a person has faith. So whenever you're reading your Bible and you see something for the very first time, pay attention because that's demonstrating what they mean when they say that. This is the first one. Just sit in that. Second one, and I want you to underline this as well. Underline the word amazed. There are only two places in the New Testament where it says Jesus is amazed. Only two. And it, it, it's one of those things, what, what amazes Jesus? You know, where does Gordon Ramsay go for a dinner where he goes, that is amazing. What impresses Jesus? It's faith. Here, he looks at this man who is on the outside. He's not even one of his countrymen. On the outside, and he sees that faith, and he says, that is amazing. The other time is when he's in Nazareth and folks, his folks reject him. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. What amazes Jesus? When we trust him to be who he is. What amazes him in a negative way is when we know who he is and we don't act like it. I love reading the early commentaries on this scene because you, you, you come out of uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is saying, hey, you, you really need to be unoffendable. Don't worry, turn the other cheek. And here you have a military officer and folks are writing, well, wouldn't you expect him to say resign from the military? No, here's a pretty easy answer. We need Christians in the military. Pretty simple. What a scene though. What a scene. Jesus says, I see your faith. And just then, that man in another place was healed. In another place. At Jesus' word, he's not even there. This man who, who is on the outside, make sure you get this. He's not Jewish. But he has faith. And Jesus heals. Third scene. While they're still in Capernaum, they visit Peter's mother-in-law's house. Most scholars believe that Peter's mother-in-law's house is, ends up being the home base. It's the home base for Jesus' Galilean ministry. We've got this picture uh, up here because archaeologists uh, 25, 30 years ago dug up a, a uh, um, crusader church from, so say, the, the 10th, 11th century crusader era church and they had records that that was built on top of another church so they built they dug underneath it and found a church underneath that from the fourth century where Constantine's mother tried to identify all of the uh, important spots they dug underneath that and they dug up this simple home there's now a whole structure built over the top of it but as they dug into that they found fishing hooks in the floor 
written on the wall, Jesus is Lord. Picture this. We actually believe that 2,000 years later, we, we don't have just the area. We have the house. The house. And uh, critical scholars, even ones who don't believe that Jesus is Lord, and yes, there are biblical scholars that don't believe it, but they're still scholars of Scripture, believe this is probably authentic. That that's really the place. Small house, two levels. This is where you would see him tearing the roof off to lower the man through. Just a simple, simple home with simple folks. But make sure you get this, they're real folks. You know, it just says, Peter's mother-in-law. If you're Peter's wife, this is mama. She's sick. And Jesus, I love that. Look, look at verse 15. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and began to serve him. I love that Matthew notes Jesus simply touched her hand. No pleading. No, Jesus, hey, w- would you heal? No, no intercession from the family. Jesus just notices. And it's unsolicited mercy. Mercy precedes effort. It didn't go, she served him even though he was sick, so he healed He healed because he's good. And then she served. If you notice, there's a pattern, and we we miss this often in the Bible. Think about the Exodus. God rescued, and then he gave the law. Grace and mercy always proceed. Any rules, anything with God. You know why? Because he's love, and he's good. He sees this woman, and he heals her. And then she responds. It always works that way. Three scenes, three healings. Why them? Why here? What is Matthew doing? Because this kind of wraps up this this section. A man with leprosy, a Roman soldier, and a sick woman. Why are they first? Each of these are excluded from the inner circle of worship. Each of these have boundaries. Each of these have something that keeps them from God. If you're you're familiar with the temple system, think about the way that it worked. The leper, he could go near the temple, but he couldn't even head up the steps. That he could only go so far. Ah, the Roman could go a little further, couldn't he? He could go into the court of Gentiles. But he couldn't go any further. As a matter of fact, archaeologists have have dug up a, a sign, literally a sign that hung above the court of Gentiles that read this. Let no foreigner enter within the parapet and the partition which surrounds the temple precinct. Anyone caught will be held accountable for his ensuing death. The woman, or the the leper was, he was excluded because of his condition. The Roman is excluded because of his race. The third, because he could go a little further, Peter's mother-in-law could go a little further yet, but there was still a wall for her, wasn't it? Because women could only go so far. They could go into the, the court of women is what it's called. But then there was a wall. Each of these has a wall of how close you can get to God. And what does Jesus do? How does he start his healing ministry? He breaks down every wall and goes to them. Everyone. He breaks down the wall. These who could never get close to the presence of God, because they're in the center of the temple, was the Holy of Holies, right? That was the, they believed that to be the literal presence of God himself. And then there's a series of walls that says, you can't go any further. You can't go any further. You can't go any further. And so Emmanuel, God with us, chose to go to them first. In Jesus, condition, race, and gender are barriers no more. What's what's Paul write? 
in Christ, it's neither male nor female, slave or free, Greek or Jew. There's nothing that separates us. Because Jesus paid the price. Jesus breaks down every barrier between us and God. That's what he does. In a few short years from this moment, th this moment in the scene, he's, he's about to start heading towards the cross. And there's something very significant, one of those details that you got to get. When he dies, the, the curtain tears from top to bottom opens up the literal presence of God to anyone who will come to him through Christ. The veil is torn. <laughs> Let's make this personal. It may be time for us to reconsider how we view folks who've been made to feel like they don't belong or they can't belong. Jesus breaks down every barrier. Perhaps it's time that we proclaim a Jesus that breaks down walls. And I can hear it now, because I'm going to hear it later. Yeah, but what about their lifestyle? What about their choices? Sure, that's important, but lead the way with grace. Lead with grace, lead with mercy, just as Jesus just demonstrated. Lead with that. We are to be a people of truth and grace. Having this conversation just earlier, we say, well, we have to find a balance between truth and grace. There is no balance between truth and grace. We are people of truth and people of grace. We are people all of both of those which means we love people regardless of where they come from, regardless of what their background is, regardless of what their sin struggle is. And as we get in and we demonstrate the beauty of Jesus Christ, we'll earn the right to speak truth to them. What we do when we lead with truth only is flat-out brutality. It is. Remember, grace without truth is hypocrisy. And truth without grace is brutality. We have to speak the truth of Jesus Christ, but lead with the way of love. That's what he does. It teaches us to see the world differently. We say, yeah, but what about, what about, what about? Here we see people who were entirely separated from the presence of God. And be the first miracles to be recorded are Jesus going to them? Make sure that that forms us about our own priorities. Make sure as we read the text, we don't just see the world different, but we realize what our priorities are. We're not here to keep each other happy. We're folks on a mission. And regardless of the circumstance, Jesus is enough. Regardless of their background, Jesus is sufficient. Regardless of what their current sin struggle is, Jesus is enough right now. Lead the way with grace. And when you have the opportunity, speak truth. Think about the, the woman caught in adultery in John 8. Jesus steps in. Who's without sin? You cast the first stone. He says, where are your accusers? Well, they're all gone. I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. See, see the pattern there? Lead with grace. Bring truth. Because Jesus can tear down every wall. There was a... Yeah, I'm not going to get into that one right now. I'm going to run out of time. You get me excited. I may preach all day. So that's not going to happen. I, I, I've heard folks for years... Say, I feel like I don't belong. I've, I've done too much. I've been too far. There's been whatever too much of this or that. What do you see here in the text? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. There's nothing. And if that is you today, first of all, I apologize if the church has led to that. 
Because sometimes people of grace can be the most graceless people around. We just can. But realize that Jesus removes every, every barrier because of his heart for sinners and the broken. His love expressed on the cross and his resurrection. It says you belong. Sure, he's probably going to move some stuff around in your life. That's what he does. I can tell you this, everything he has changed in my life and everything he's continuing to change have only been for my better. I can say that after several decades of following him. Make sure we get these scenes as they are. It's by grace that we're saved. It's from a good God who sees broken, sees people separated from him. And he starts by going to them first. How does that form us with the way that we see the rest of the world? How does it form us in the way that we see our own salvation? To him alone be glory. He's worthy of it all. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I thank you for this text. I thank you for your heart that is so good. I think of the way that, that your heart is gentle, lowly. We see it here in the text lived out. Help us as people who have come to know you. Help us to keep that front and center. Help us to see the world differently. Help us to, to love differently. And help us for ourselves to realize that it is by your grace and your grace alone, your goodness towards us. You're amazing. We praise you today. Amen.